and welcome everyone to uh, astrology, the persistent synchronicity. <laughs> um, uh, today I'm going to talk about how I once made a connection between synchronicity, also called meaningful coincidences, and astrology, and this set me on a path to better understand them both. Uh, if if it didn't get into the recording, my name is Sue Kentz, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you. First, let me tell you, um, if you don't know a lot about astrology, that's okay, as I'm going to give you enough information for you to see how astrology professionals pinpoint when people reach their life milestones, like making a big discovery or having a life-changing challenge, those moments when you're redirecting your lives. And this involves patterns and uh, recognizing patterns and how they repeat. Um, it's kind of like what having a synchronicity is like, that we interpret uh, something catches our attention and some nagging similarity with our thoughts or situation that we then interpret as a personal message or instruction. This also happens in astrology. It just takes an astrologer to draw up the chart and recognize and interpret the symbolic uh, <clears throat> patterns involved. So one last thing. Um, new planets discovered in the Kuiper Belt in the 2000s are changing and improving astrology. These dwarf planets, the least of them twice the size of the largest asteroids, provide many more accurate readings and historical an an analyses I've found. They've been crucial in helping me develop my findings, so I will be introducing them to you along the way. And now to tell you how this all began. And I just want to also mention, I won't be able to look at the chat, and I have no one to monitor the chat for me. Uh, I will answer questions at the end. Uh, so, but put things in your chat. I just uh, wanted to mention that. In 1981, I was visiting, uh, I was flying to visit my parents as, as I wanted to marry a man who was a lot older than me and of a different race and he wanted my parents to consent. I was 25 at the time, and he was 44, a retired Air Force navigator with a young daughter. I decided I couldn't just call my parents about this. I had to go in person. But on the way, I got stuck in Atlanta's airport, and I began to worry about two things. How was my dad going to react? And was I going to miss my next connection home to Allentown? I had just started studying astrology with a professional in New Orleans, and as I sat there in the, in the plane, I wished I had his big chart calculator. This was before astrology apps and software. It isn't, there were no cell phones. There were no personal computers. But he had this huge cutting-edge chart printer, and that's how we looked at charts. If I had had that with me, I could look at the exact moment of time and ask a question. How will my dad react to my marriage plans? But I was also worried about when the plane would get on its way. So I really had two questions. Um, when will I, will I make my connection? And that's when I realized that if I could run the chart, whatever answer I got would be the same for both questions as they were pressing on me at the exact same time. And just then, a flight attendant got on the PA system and said, well, we're just about to leave now for Washington, D.C. for passengers changing to, uh, but for passengers changing to D.C. to uh, go on to um, ABE Airport in Allentown, uh, don't worry about making that next connection because the pilots for that flight are on this plane. So I was stunned. One of my questions has now been answered and in a positive way. But what does it mean? Uh, you know, uh, does that mean the other bigger question has also been answered? And and what does on the same plane kind of signify? I wondered if it was like in the same boat. Sure enough, when I landed in Pennsylvania, the first thing my dad did was take me to meet someone who turned out to be his girlfriend. My parents were still married at this point. But I began to realize that both of us, my dad and I, were indeed in the same boat. We were in relationships that were considered unconventional, socially unacceptable, yet they made us happy. My father had been miserable for decades, but n neither my parents would do anything about it. I realized my dad wouldn't have a very good argument for me to give me <laughs> when, I, when I told him. But all that mattered less to me as I was so taken with the experience that just happened. Right away, I felt it was like astrology. It could be used in place of astrology. 
if you had a pressing question, you just pay attention to your surroundings and you might get a clue of what was happening. If astrology could provide an answer from way up in the heavens, why wouldn't a similar message or answer be perhaps available right where you were? So then from there, two, two decades pass, during which time I'm even unaware of the word synchronicity. I call it parallel situations. I notice them periodically and I try to figure out what caused them. I really had no idea that even other people had them, except some people might say, I got a sign about something. But my experiences seem more elaborate. At the same time, I learned more about astrology, although it's, it wasn't completely impressing me, but I just assumed I had more to learn. Uh, and the navigator and I never did marry, but broke up. And then I was married someone else, but that didn't work either. Then in 1986, a synchronicity occurred one night as I was praying, am I crazy to move to California to be near this guy, Homer? <laughs> It was crazy as Homer and I broke up and he was moving back to California. I'd been watching a video on TV and it shut off. Broadcast TV was playing. I wasn't even paying attention. But to my surprise, a voice on the TV said my name, Susan. And then faith is believing when common sense tells you not to. I'd never seen this movie before, but it's answering me. I, I, so it's not crazy to move to California? <laughs> The movie was Miracle on 34th Street, and it being Christmas, this movie plays at, all the time at holidays, uh, played again a few days later, and I watched it to see if I had misheard. No, the little girl was indeed named Susan, and her mother said her name and said that sentence. But later in the movie, I heard Susan had a little boyfriend. His name was Homer. That did it. I moved to California in 1987, the next year, I didn't actively pursue my Homer plan, and so Homer didn't magically materialize, which many times made me feel like I was an idiot for believing he would. But in 1995, I joined a softball team, the Homers. Mr. Homer and I, uh, uh, um, and there I met Mr. Homer, so-called because he hit the most home runs on the team. Mr. and Homer actually did get together, and we're still together 29 years later. And all through this, I'm still working with and tracking astrology. So uh, first, a few things for me to actually, uh, you know, since I'm assuming you're not going to know much, if at all, about astrology, I need you to understand a few things. Uh, and even before I get to the astrology part I w and, and how, how the planets move and, how, and what that all means, I w it will really help if you understood where we humans stand in the scheme of things. And this means you must be introduced to the most pervasive pattern in the universe. I think this will really explain a lot uh, when it all is said and done. And after that, I will explain how you get your celestial ID card that gives you access to astrology's persistent synchronicity. And now for that incredible repeating pattern. It's a powerful center and orbiting members. Now, I'm going to just go through these really quick because I think you could tell right off the bat that this is probably a solar system you're looking at. Powerful center, the sun, and orbiting members are the planets. How about this uh, powerful center and orbiting members? You see the sun is no longer yellow. It's black, a black hole. But we're talking a galaxy. So this is really a supermassive black hole that is the big power orbiting and because orbiting it is solar systems and stars, a lot of bigger. How about this uh, diagram? Powerful center again, but it's with the stylized Jupiter uh, icon there. It's Jupiter. It's a planetary system. It's uh, uh, the planet. The gas giant is the powerful center and the moons are the orbiting members. In fact, you, you, you can tell that gas giants a lot have multiple moons and they're like many solar systems. This might be a little difficult. This is a, a, a large galaxy that's actually in a grouping, a large galaxy group. Uh, this could be like the Milky Way in the middle, which is a large galaxy that has dwarf galaxies that orbit it. Um, and then these, these are kind of two of the 50 of uh, galaxy, many galaxies that orbit the Milky Way but they each have a black hole in the center, but the actual galaxy now is the powerful center. 
Now here, this is a little different again, but you're, I think you'll get the idea. I've kind of given you a hint with the powerful shared center here. And it's because our local group, which it's actually called the local group, uh, is our local galaxy group, which has the Milky Way and the other big galaxy, which is Andromeda. And the, the shared center, the, the, the center of gravity is between those two big behemoths. Uh, but it's still a powerful center with orbiting members because all of them orbit around that shared center. So it still uh, is is part of this uh, pattern. How about this uh, diagram? We've actually gone all the way down now to the, the increasingly small rather than the huge celestial. This is an atom with its nucleus in the in middle and the electrons being the orbiting members. Does this uh, does this diagram possibly uh, uh, have the same same elements? Powerful powerful center, rather supporting members. This is a nucleus. This is the cell nucleus, though a eukaryotic cell, and it has a powerful center, and it has supporting members, uh, other elements of the cell that are actually helping uh, do the business of the cell. So where are we in this hierarchy? Uh, we have, uh, I didn't even go through all the different uh, larger and larger types of galaxy groups, uh, but we are over here in this question mark saying, well, we, we're not a, a bunch of balls and, 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 and nucleuses and, and uh, large masses. Uh, so how do we fit in? How about this? Is, uh, is it possible that our hearts being centrally located and pumping blood throughout our bodies are acting as a powerful center? And we have limbs that support our movements and a head full of senses that assist perception. This figure uh, could belong here in this hierarchy. Humans also have been known to kind of behave like the planets. People in groups sometimes assemble in a pattern of powerful center and orbiting members. You see on the left, you have a maypole, uh, maypole dance. And on the right, these are pilgrims uh, uh, moving around the Kaaba at the Hajj. They might be purposely mimicking the movements of the planets, I would grant. But humans do group in this configuration. We frequently group around a powerful leader or other figure or central group. Here we see Congress listening to the US president on the left and on the right, the United States assembly addressed by a speaker. We even have uh, moments where we wanna go see our stars at a big assembly, uh, like at this concert where you have Admittedly, they're rock stars, but we call them stars that are in the center and we uh, group around them. So we belong. We actually do belong in this colossal pattern that infuses all reality, whether it's at work, with relatives, strangers. We are members or even leaders uh, in many different groups. Is there a way to actually show that we connect to the rest or are we exceptions? That's a question for astrology. Are we connecting to the solar system? How How is that a relation to us? And I could say, you see that connection with astrology, but I have wanted something better, something more convincing to people. Um, and then one day, a 1933 movie uh, named Berkeley Square gave me an idea. The lead character postulated a way to see the past by moving away from the earth into the sky. And this is what he had come up with. He was telling someone uh, that he was beside a river and it reminded him of time flowing from past to future. But by standing nearby, he really couldn't see its source uh, or, or see its end, the, uh, which would indicate like a past and a future, the source and the end where it would empty somewhere into, into a larger body, body of water. But he thought viewing from some height, like a plane, he could see uh, more, high, uh, more of the river. He could see more of its past and, and farther down or the future. And the idea had me thinking, why stop there? If more height is necessary if you were on a mountain and you had some binoculars that would give you even more power to see people at all phases of their day which gives this ability to see their path 
you could see uh, uh, what was going down and what they were going to expect down the road. Maybe a friend that they would meet or somebody that they would run into that might give them trouble. In, in, in thinking of our own technology of today, what about from a spy satellite? Um, that then you even see more of, a, of a, an area and the way people would move around. Or the International Space Station, you could see weather systems moving over continents and see the type of things that were going to afflict all sorts of people uh, in, their, uh, in their future. So if one has special abilities by pulling back from Earth farther and farther, what abilities might you get by pulling back so far as to see the entire solar system? As you know, astrologers do just that. Now, you don't need a real-time photo of that to pull back that enormous amount because computer software can draw a representation of the soft solar system, uh, just as we see here, because the positions are accurate and, um, and well-known well and stable. So here's what the solar system looked like when we began our talk today. This might look totally strange to you, I, I, I grant, but this depicts the planet, sun, and moon that are all around us as we are on the Earth, which would be the center here, where all these lines are, uh, here being the sun and here being the moon. Since we are all on the Earth, we aren't dis it distinguish distinguishable, are we? Everyone on Earth is at the same point, and so how do we see our unique selves in this view? You need a time identity. So taking these positions, we would wind them in reverse back to the time of your birth. And that is your celestial ID card, what astrologers call your birth chart, in which we can see you in time terms. Using that, we can see how any one of us moves down the path of our lives, but uh, again, a few more basics before we get to that fun stuff. Astrology is not just the 12 signs. And you, you find this out if you start looking at uh, it through the eyes of a professional. Astrology, like synchronicities, is about something unfolding in time. When you experience a sudden synchronicity, even if it's just an appearance of a static, meaningful, positive or negative sign, that sign somehow fits into your situation in the story you're living. Astrology is also a story, an epic ongoing narrative. This happens, then that, and that, etc. And you most definitely fit into it. Just as we move through life, the celestial bodies in the solar system move. We interact with our surroundings and so do the planets. We can interpret that movement and we can then see how our personal life our life story fits into the solar system's ongoing story, but you need to know what to look for. And you need relationships. You need to understand that the kind of relationships we have are very similar to the relationships we look at in a chart. So here you are on the earth. What might you find here? And, and I know I'm going very basic, but I'm really trying to bring you from the ground up. There's basic closeness. It, there's family, friends, supportive people, friendly strangers, people who come to your house to do things. You can sometimes get as close as almost zero degrees away from such people. They're coming up and, uh, and doing things for you, and you're comfortable with them. In astrology, planets appear like they're so close, they're near to, or at zero degrees from one another, and it's called a conjunction. It's like a new moon, and it can be very positive, but if you're conjunct the wrong person or the two planets, one of them is the wrong, uh, as a, a negative planet, that can be a, a, a difficult thing. So it can go either way. I can uh, just warn you now that that's true. What does distance mean then? When you see someone approaching you, you can't be sh quite sure if they're friendly or trouble. You might not see who it is. Who Who is that coming towards me across the street? Um that's a p person who is 180 degrees from you. And in astrology, two planets that are up opposite one another is an opposition that's 180 degrees, um, like a full moon, of course. Then certain configurations are stressful. 
let's say you and a partner are in tension with another couple. It could just be a simple game that you're playing, but you, you and your partner are against the other, the other pair. And they're 90 degrees from you by sitting in the other seats uh, as you sit across from your partner at a card on a, at a card table, you know, um, or, so that's that's where there's there's some tension going on between the f- four positions there. Think of it even as each person here, instead of just in a, a, a seat, seated at a table, is in a car moving towards each other at an intersection. And what if the lights aren't uh, work, working, the traffic lights? That could be trouble. That could be very stressful. Um so whether it's you're, you're attending an intervention or the people at a, a table are vying for center stage, there is a, a inherent tension in uh, especially four persons at all, all 90 degrees away. You see planets that are all 90 degrees away from uh, the, themselves in a circle. That's called a grand cross. And just one leg, one uh uh, one leg, uh, uh, two two planets in ninety degrees is a square. This is stressful. You could double that stress if you added another uh, grand cross within the first one, uh, and that's what is represented here. If you uh, entered a clearing and suddenly there wasn't just four, uh, three other people there, but there were seven people there, you would feel you might be under attack. And that's would be like a double grand cross in astrology. I think you might be getting the ideas now. Uh, each person, instead of being 90 degrees for, apart, is 45 degrees apart. So divisions of the circle into two and its multiples, two, four, eight. These are major uh, uh it, it challenges for a person. The eight is not as major a challenge as, say, the two f- and four but they definitely are um, things that you have to deal with. And usually the best way to deal with is to work on it. But we'll get more into the, those kind of strategies. This is just recapping what I just showed you. So we're going to move on to talk about some good parts, uh, some good points in, in uh, uh, that, that we have uh, uh, to look at. And those are the divisions of three, a division of a circle in three. And I've often thought that perhaps the the advantages a triangle which that would describe is stable uh, pyramids have been one of the most long-lasting structures that we've seen on the earth a three-legged stool a very simple thing a three-legged stool it doesn't wobble like a, a, a table that has four legs and coming in threes is considered so fortunate so there's something about the the number three uh, and even if you just have uh, uh, two people at two positions uh, at, and at just 120 degrees away, seeing the planets that are 100, 120 degrees away called just a simple trine is a fortunate thing to see. And a second uh, intertwined triangle would give us uh, a division of six. And that is also something that's supportive and helpful. Uh, in, in our own terms, that would form a Star of David. Uh, or represent the union of male and female that uh, Dan Brown in his book, uh, The Da Vinci Code, uh, mentioned. It was also mentioned in the movie. Uh, it's demonstration of balance and perfection. And if you see uh, in an astrology chart, uh, the, the six uh, positions all filled, that's a grand sextile. It's very special. It's something that uh, it, it's, it's, it would be a surprising thing to see. Um, and again, these are these are the fortunate aspects. And there, you if when you put all of these in a circle, you you go from one to another, uh, uh, challenging, supportive, challenging, supportive. They're interspersed within each other. And so, as things move around the circle, uh, you have uh, things always happening. And this is again, I'm just recapping and mentioning that uh, there are astrologers who do other divisions uh, five. Divisions of five also show talent and helpful traits. Um, others are, are are lesser used. But for my purposes, since we don't have a lot of time, I want you to see moments of definitive achievement and, and or hardship. So we need those small divisions of the circle in the twos and the threes. Now to view a person's uh, sun patterns. What we're going to do, and I'm really going to, you know, uh, 
<clears throat> this is just a little example to prepare you for what I'm going to walk you through. But when I go and look at some, somebody, uh, you know, I'm looking at a chart, whether it's a historical person or it's a per person I've met, uh, I look at uh, the the inner planets in their chart, and those give me some components of their personality. Like, for example, I would examine, put the sun at the top and say, where are all the angles to that sun? And then go to Mercury. Where, where's everything uh, for Mercury and Venus, Mars, and the moon? And this is because the sun, each of those uh, have something to do with the um, the per person's uh, personality. The sun is their life, their health, their life's purpose, what they love. And so if I was looking at, uh, if this was a real person, and this is just an example uh, of, of that type of analysis, I would say, oh, he's got a, a sextile to Jupiter and a trine to Uranus. Um, that would be very um, uh, fortunate. Uh, so this is someone fun, outgoing, enjoys a good time, the sextile to Jupiter. Uh, smart, uh, a, a unique person with the trine to Uranus. Opposite Pluto, uh, well, there's it would be like, uh, in, in some ways, the person either wants to empower other people or or have power over other people. I would have to kind of figure out where that person's uh, life choices were to start to determine that. Um, and then I would look at these, there's a the semi-square from Venus and Neptune and Mars and say, mm, well, this is uh, uh, something where there's an idealism in relationships. Uh, and that's a little fraught with the Mars involved because Mars would be passion or even competition. Um, and you get the idea. I would start to go all through these and collect these observations. And then I would go and look at Mercury because Mercury would give me clues to how this person thinks, converses, expresses themselves. And you'll always notice, and in, in fact, this will become important later for you to understand, you will always see Mercury uh, around the sun, you will, you will, and uh, Venus too, because they're in, inward to the sun from us. Uh, you'll never see Venus over here in a chart. And that's because you would have to be standing on Mercury to do so. Um, so Mercury uh, would, would, this is, this is a obvious, uh, while this isn't a real person, I didn't want to feel like doing something outrageous with where I wanted to stick the sun. But I've just uh, used the same Jupiter and Uranus here to say, okay, with Mercury, this uh, person has uh, uh, extraordinary gifts uh, with his uh, communication skills. Uh, Venus, Jupiter, and uh, Uranus are all on those three uh, uh, positions, um, or three or six positions. Uh, but the moon and Saturn is 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 both square to his his Mercury, this person's Mercury. So, uh, work and practice or experience might be required to uh, overcome important drawbacks to the best communication skills, maybe like nervousness when speaking in public. And then I would go on to like here's where his Mars is. He or she, this person's Mars is, uh, and you know, in this sense, I have a a grand trine with the sun Uranus and oh well that would uh, be a very able-bodied person comfortable with himself uh Mars sextile Jupiter here oh well an exceptional marker for uh positively channeling his passion uh maybe he is in sports uh or military service and so on so you get the idea uh and you know we would we would go on to those other bodies I was telling you but I think you're now ready to see the planetary synchronicity that I'm that really displays people's lives being lived. And I, as I said, I'm going to walk you through how people move through time. Uh, although it's a funny thing in astrology, a person's birth chart is treated as static. The planets move and relate to you, or that is the representation. Um, but most astrologers, to see a person moving in through their life. They use two analyses techniques together. Uh, there's the transiting planets, which I think is what most people understand if they have any basics in astrology, that these are the in the sky in real time. Their position tells you what challenges or, su or supports what's happening now. But if you want to know about the past, 
you can rewind uh, the, the, the actual real-time planets to view the past. Like someone says, uh, I had my boss said something to me a couple weeks ago, and it's really bothered me. Can we look at that? And you rewind the planets and say, yes, we can see what was happening then. Or you want to fast forward to like, I, I'm going to ask my girlfriend to marry me in three weeks. And can you see if the date looks like it would be a good date? We could fast forward to check that future date. But professionals also check a second thing. Most professionals do. And it's called secondary progression. But we're just going to call it progression. And it's the progress planets is the term for referencing the days after birth as if they represented years. In other words, the 100 days after your birth contains a supplemental pattern that tells your story that for the first 100 years. And it's it's really brief, that pattern, but it's and it's not real time because even though we can see what's happening now by looking at those days after birth, um, it, it's, it's not happening that you were a baby then, right? But So why would that work? More on that later. But. I think, feel that if if this is not real time, but representational, I suspect that the, the transiting planets in a lot of ways are representational. And that I just mentioned, because a lot of people have the wonder is, is there something being beamed down? Is there a gravity that's being exerted by planets? And I, I, I most people don't believe that there is a force making you do anything. Just wanted to mention that. So now for the example lives, which will be what we're building up to all this time, we're going to look at a few people and see a major moment in their life. Uh, and we're using people who are well, very well known, as is uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, most people know who that is. Uh, but to just mention, mention it, um, he's the reverend and leader of the U.S. Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, well, I haven't given you details now on what the new planets each mean and only minor uh, ideas of the uh, the planets that uh, the classical and modern planets. I'm going to provide you keywords as we go along. Again, I felt, did this in the because it was going to be the fastest way to get to the good things and get you to see how this works. The important thing is for you to see milestones happening on time in the lives of people whom we know well, whose lives are documented. And we know a lot about Dr. King. So let's look at his challenges. And using these highlighted circles, we'll notice Dr. King has some challenging figures. He has the sun with new planet Gong Gong, indicative of someone a, a compassionate and sensitive. And they're opposite both Pluto and and uh, and new new planet Haumea. Pluto is power, and Haumea is great change. And they're square Jupiter, which you've seen before, which is kind of a beneficent, supportive, uh, good-natured planet. And asteroid Vesta, which is a uh, a service and uh, and and work dedication. Now you might notice that. These oppositions in 90 degree squares aren't exact, but separated by a few degrees. If you're uh, perusing here and looking at the, this is uh, 25 degrees around the circle, and these are 17 and and one and 18 and one. Uh, maybe you think uh, that those aren't really 90 degrees and 180 degrees uh, 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 angles. And see, in a birth chart, a major angle like a square or opposition is considered in force if it's within seven to eight degrees of exactness. And this is just something that you're told when you learn astrology. But remember how I mentioned progression, looking at the days after birth as if they were years? Um, look at the sun degree. It will become exactly square and oppose that uh, Jupiter and Haumea in see it's six days so something will happen to king at age six we should expect what great change Haumea happens something that is fortunate expansive for him jupiter there is something that corresponds to that progression indicator in 1935 reverend michael king senior changed his and his son's name to martin luther king 
after two uncles named Martin and Luther. That is what happens when the progressed sun gets to one Aquarius, square Jupiter and opposite Haumea. Haumea is the change and Jupiter is the enlargement of self he gets with a name like Martin Luther, shades of the Protestant reformer who took on the Catholic Church. Martin Luther King Jr. will instead take on the powerful Southern segregationalists. So we're just gonna move along. I'm not gonna hit everything that I even might have indicated. We're gonna look at some supportive indicators for Dr. King. He has a grand trine in his, for his son, for Sun Gong Gong, uh, and he's got a Mars uh, minor grand trine, that, which is two sextiles and a trine over here. And here's the Mars. The benefits of the sun with compassionate Gong Gong life path he is on is the first trine to new planet dwarf, uh, dwarf planet Orcus is he loves order, lawfulness, set procedure, as any reverend would, right? And that's all about Orcus. And yet he has another almost competing perspective represented by this other trine with these additional newcomers. He has an inner vision, uh, this V uh, icon for Varda, Tolkien's queen of the stars, brings unusual vision and an urge to push, push back on unfair laws represented by IX next to Varda, uh, Ixion, a mythological rule breaker. And this compassionate life King strives for is to try to fight segregation, which is an unfair law, but to do so peacefully, like the compassion and orderly, no fighting back, he will tell his followers. And so to fight without fighting. Now you look at Mars and this grand trine for his Mars. It's conjunct Maki Maki which is one of the major new planets, indicative of surprise and shock. His method of fighting will be unusual, unorthodox, shocking, when people see his followers on TV being beaten and not fighting back. Mars Maki Maki are supported by Vesta, work, service, doing whatever is necessary, and large asteroid palace, the mythological palace Athena, uh, she fought for right, not for victory or personal glory. He has a perfect Mars and a perfect sun to enact this vision. So let's look at his Mercury, his mind. He's got a mind that is uh, a, a, a bit stressed, uh, not majorly, but he's got a semi-square and two sesquiquadrates. This semi-square is with uh, Saturn at first. He's conservative, careful. All these are Saturn qualities, and they're not supportive because of the semi-square, but they're on his mind, per perhaps not against his thinking completely. It's just a nagging reminder to him that he must monitor his words and his meaning. But you also see Mercury is in sesquiquadrate with Maki Maki and Ixion Varda, and we've already heard about these objects, and they have to be working uh, in the same way. He's, go he's going to be conservative his me in his message, but he's going to be unpredictable and novel as well. His speeches will naturally mention visions of an ideal future, the Varda, as he encourages pushback against the injustice of Southern Jim Crow restrictions, the Exion. He also has support. He has a, a trine to an unnamed new planet designated 2002 MS4, that was its discovery name. It does not have a official name. It is the largest unnamed body in our solar system. And it means this, King doesn't dream up his own strategy. He heard about Mahatma Gandhi's civil rights work in South Africa and India. He learned all he could about Gandhi's methods. He did the research. People with support from an unnamed planet I call MS4, I just put MS for an icon for it, have read the books and delved into whatever they needed to know. And King had this trait. And now we have arrived at King's first challenge. This is the birth chart here. We're going to look at the transits first that are going to be outside uh, of, of, of the birth, and, you know, in these little boxes. Um, 
And we see that it's one year after the Supreme Court ruled segregation in Southern schools was unconstitutional. We're looking at, uh, at, at the bottom here. This is the start of the bus boycott, December 5th, 1955. It's a, this is, like I said, a, a while from when the, the, the uh, Supreme Court ruling. What next, uh, they thought, uh, when this ruling came down? It took a year and a half for this opportunity to come. The arrest of Rosa Parks in Montgomery on December 1 for refusing to give up her bus seat to a white person. So many people have heard of this. Hopefully you have, but in case not, that's why I'm mentioning it. And this was the moment when she was arrested. And what do we see here in transiting planets in the sky at the time? King is under great pressure. Here's his son, and he's getting pressure from new planet Sedna and uh, his his uh, friends from his birth, Ixion and Varda. But Sedna has moved down here, and it's square his son. And this is a a, a, a very tough uh, tough body to have uh, in a square position. Uh, Sedna is named after an Arctic sea goddess. He is facing people who will freeze him out of his rights. They are cold and calculating, clinging to power, negative Sedna. And on the other hand, he has his vision, uh, Varda, and his belief he can challenge unfair laws, Ixion. They, they're now in a square position because it's his time to act. He's got to actually do something. He's got to work at this vision he has had. And now is the time. It's a few days after the arrest, uh, but he he's talking to his uh, compadres. What about a bus, bus boycott? And look at the transiting sun and Mercury. There are sextile his Mercury, supportive of him and his ideas. Gong Gong has moved to conjunct his Mercury. It's time to tell his people with all the compassion he can muster. We're going to have a bus boycott. It's going to be difficult. You are not to take the bus. You will have to work to uh, walk to work to home every day until this is over. Uh, he has to tell them how difficult it will be, but encourage them to be strong and persevere. Now, what does this progression thing show, which is supposed to be telling us the same thing? It shows that his progressed son, which started over here at 25 Capricorn, has moved all the way here to 22 Aquarius in an exact trine to his progressed Mars. This is the perfect time for action. And amazingly, his progressed Mercury has repositioned itself. It was moving ahead of the sun as since he had been born, but it got to that point where it can't go any farther. It has to start doubling back because it's going to stay orbiting around the sun. And it's gotten to here where it's reforming that semi-square with Saturn again. It's, it's uh, again, this is the repeated pattern of his birth. This is like a synchronicity uh, that astrology gives us. And indeed, this is what he was born for, this moment when he must counsel his people and give them this tough news. He's got a difficult plan to execute. But look at his progressed moon. It's about to trine his progressed Pluto. If they keep to the plan, and they do, he will become more capable, more powerful, and more able to make important strides for their civil rights. And by the end of December, his strike gets the Montgomery buses desegregated. It is a victory. And just to show you again, going back to the birth, uh, birth uh, chart, here is the progressed chart, uh, the progressed planets above it. That Mercury went all the way down here and then had to come back to here as the sun had moved actually to conjunct <laughs> the uh, asteroid palace fight for right as he's beginning the good fight. And but Saturn also has to move up to complete that ex uh, near exact semi square at this time within six minutes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, eight celestial uh, minutes of exactitude. It's really an incredible thing to see. Everything is just completely gelling for him. And now to another example. I'm going to show you just people in various professions to show you, and, and, and in various periods of time, to show you this keeps working. It's just incredible to wit witness. 
And now we're going to go 500 years earlier before King's important victory to the birth of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the great thinker and famed paint uh, artist. Though born before the discovery of America, we have an authoritative chart because his father wrote the day and time of his birth in the family Bible. But you see here, he has great challenges. He has sun opposite new planet Maki Maki, which we've always uh, uh, already discussed, um, which and uh, and we'll get to it. And uh, square Pluto, um, which makes him ha having a trouble of really being having his own agency. He didn't really have much power on his own, except in his great talent. And it's because he was an illegitimate child. He had to work for a living for rich patrons or military men. Now, we don't know the day-to-day -day activities or even much of a timeline for Leonardo, but we have enough to use progression to see the crowning achievement of his life. But first, let's see the beauty he would create because it's already indicated in his celestial ID. Leonardo has a grand sextile. Of course he does. <laughs> this is the painter of the most famous painting in the world. Uh, the Mona Lisa. And there are female symbols and representations of genius all over this grand sextile. His uh, son is sextile Juno, uh, the third asteroid discovered, uh, the spouse, uh, and trine dwarf planet Ceres, also uh, the first asteroid discovered, now, now considered a dwarf planet. Uh, and it's a mother figure, uh, not someone who serves as a mother, uh, because the real mother is the moon, which, which is the other sextile he has, conjunct Jupiter, which gives it uh, a, 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 a expansiveness. Uh, personal emotions are expressed freely. He's got a good feeling for women, I would say. And he also has his son try new planet Quawar, uh, which is about play fun, uh, gambling, experimenting, and Le Leonardo in his notebooks was always sketching experimental contraptions, flying machines, plans for a submarine and other futuristic creations. And then the sun is opposite Maki Maki. He's someone far ahead of his time, um, often misunderstood by his peers. And that's why uh, often you say it, Maki Maki shocks and, and, and it seems unpredictable because people just don't understand it. It's, it's a, a, a whole level up than uh, a, a Uranian, uh, a, a <clears throat> uh, the meaning of Uranus, which is about the new and the different and revolutions. And just to point out, um, there is a, an incredible other grand trine for his Mars group. He had many gifts, uh, more good fortune there. Um, but let's, because we're talking about him as the painter, we need to look at Venus uh, because any, a famous painter, you would have to look at Venus. And we see Venus is in a beautiful uh, uh, sextile to Uranus and a trine to asteroid Vesta. He makes great strides in learning about musculature, which helps him in his paintings. Just he's a groundbreaking in this uh, because he wants to know about the mechanics of what's under the skin of a, of a human form, what's under uh, to, so he can draw human hands and bodies more accurately. And he does this by obtaining and dissecting dead bodies. And that was very difficult and unusual work. And that's why I'm saying the Uranus uh, Vesta is something that early on he needed to delve into this uh, this very disturbing uh, type of investigation, but he knew it was uh, it, it had to be done, and it should have been done hundreds of years before, but uh, it was usually very taboo. Uh, nobody could do this, not even doctors. Um, but his results as he paints it were, of course, astoundingly accurate depictions of the human form. It was just marvelous. Now we'll see the Mona Lisa because we know the month and year that Leonardo, now 51 years old, begins to paint the Mona Lisa. It's just incredible that we it, it, we need the month to see what we're going to see, which is that gives us the progressed moon. And what do we have? We see the progressed moon is opposite Venus and Uranus and Juno. Um, he looks absolutely smitten by the woman posing for this portrait. This is probably when he's 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 met the woman who will be the Mona Lisa. 
uh, it's not that he falls in love with her. I wouldn't say that. He never married, he never had a rumored love interest. He's believed to have been a co closeted homosexual because to be out at that time would be terribly dangerous. But he loved women, loved his mother and his stepmother after his mother died. All reports suggested that the woman pictured at, as Mona Lisa had this engaging personality. And it's like we can see that he's he's there. He's there as the worker and he's got this job. And then he meets this person and she's probably someone's fiance or, or wife. And she's just delightful. She's unusual for for the time. Maybe she's she's just uh, very very engaging and, and not uh, pulling back because she's meeting somebody she doesn't know. And uh, he's enraptured by that. You see these uh, uh, trines and sextiles that are uh, supporting this uh, this figure. And it's not only that. If you uh, this is also a reforming of Venus's natal pattern. And to remind you, even though we just saw it, I put it here on the side. You remember it was a sextile to Uranus and a trine to Vesta. Now Venus has moved to be conjunct uh, Uranus and opposite Vesta. So this is the repeated patterns like, like seeing a synchronicity. He was born for this time. This is That is not to say he was fated to paint the Mon Mona Lisa. Whatever his choice in life, he was going to confront beauty and do something about it at this time. But at the same time, as he's just starting this job, Mercury is just beginning to form a grand trine with Jupiter and Maki Maki. Um, if this, you know, this is exciting to see because uh, that now you know the next few years indeed will be productive as he spends those years getting the painting to a near finished state. Oops, sorry. There are markers uh, that there were difficulties right at the beginning, and yet we don't know enough to know what they were. Uh, it, it could be anything, but he, he's got a Mercury sesquisquadrate to his uh, to, to his se uh, Sedna and Mars sesquisquadrate to uh, Pluto. Uh, but it, it wasn't all smooth sailing in the beginning, and it's just interesting to see that. But we can't really make any determination of that because of the lack of detail back then. But what we do know is in three years from that time, the painting was mostly finished. And we can see that because now his progressed Venus has started to leave the opposition with Vesta. It, it's now stopped being this task he's been doing. And now he's seeing the artwork because his progressed Venus is actually <clears throat> has actually sextiled uh, uh, Neptune, which is about artists and artwork. And, and things of the imagination. And this was, you know, not just uh, something like a photograph. He was making this imaginative uh, rendering of this person uh, for his final work. And now you see progressed uh, Mercury has gotten fully into the uh, grand trine with Maki Maki and Jupiter. And even the progressed moon is, um, whoops, sorry. Is, has joined Jupiter, and that is actually a repeat of his natal moon-Jupiter moon pattern. So there's that as well. Um, uh, and uh, nevertheless, even though it's mostly finished, he's still working on this and won't let it go. Uh, but we do have another milestone that we can check, which is 11 years after this moment where we had a report that it was mostly finished. And this is when Leonardo is forced to stop working on the Mona Lisa because his hand becomes paralytic. And you can see this terrible tension because now the moon and Mercury have moved to up, up opposite Vesta. He cannot work anymore. Uh, he's no longer the worker. He has to stop. Uh, and it's disturbing. It's 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 preying on his mind. You can see additional markers of that with Mars in Pisces opposite Neptune in in and you know it's Neptune. It can be an illness, and he's just now he just can't do it. And yet it it doesn't matter because his progressed sun has, as I was saying, showing you, uh, Mercury had come up. Uh, uh, into this area and now has moved on 
the sun was following it. Now it has gotten into this grand trine with Jupiter and Maki Maki. Um, he's done enough. It's perfect. There's even a minor grand trine over here in these green cir cir circles with actually very large persistent planets. Um, he, he's he, he, The great artist is here and has achieved what he needed to achieve. Um, I just would say one little detail, this progressed sun at six cancer, um, wouldn't it be absolutely beautiful if, if it was absolutely nestled in that grand trine? It's it's almost a little early uh, because what if it could be at seven or eight, right? Then it would be ultimately complete. Well, it actually did do that uh, two years later when progressed son is at eight cancer is when he dies in 1519. And then it is perfected when death finalizes both his life and the painting. And now lastly, we're going to look at Albert Einstein. We had a great activist, a great artist, and now a great scientist. And, and, and granted, these people have extraordinary milestones. They show extraordinary patterns, uh, but everyone has these patterns and they're, they're marvelous when you see them. Now with, uh, with, <clears throat> with Einstein, it's interesting. His son has no uh, squares to it, uh, no, no opposition. There was, <laughs> you know, no stopping him, even though he worked very hard. It's not that. Uh, but he has a, a, a minor grand trine here with two sextiles to uh, Pluto Haumea and one to Mars, and Mars in, inherits the trine to Pluto Haumea. He, he, he was a powerful person who changed the world. Uh, and he also has a grand trine, which is similar to Dr. King in a way. He's got Ixion. Uh, he's the rebel. He's, he's overturning Newtonian physics. Um, He's got a sensitivity, but it's not a personal sensitivity. It's one that he applied during his to his work. He 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 would be able to get the in a nutshell something about a difficult problem. He had a sensitivity like that, um, and also uh, MS is here. Uh, but it's he also was uh, doing great research. Uh, you know, whereas whereas that was that wasn't a part of of King and his grand trine, but a part of his mind and his his thinking. Um, but in this was part of uh, Einstein's life. And the one thing about that's kind of unusual that most people wouldn't imagine true of Einstein uh, that you see if you're an astrologer, you you see this very difficult Mercury. It's got uh, Saturn on one side and Sedna on the other. And 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 uh, it, the dwarf planet, if you're looking at dwarf planets, Sedna is almost uh, making this even worse. Uh, but he had a way of using his mind to be very focused, very laser focused into something and, and cut out everything about the outside world. Um, the problem was that he also tended to... Um, have trouble grasping innovations that he himself had not investigated so thoroughly, like quantum mechanics when it came along in the 1920s. And that experimental work you could almost see here with Quaur Vesta is square his Mercury. Um, he resisted that a long time, uh, unfortunately. And now we'll go into the milestones and uh, perhaps some of you, uh, you've know, probably heard of general relativity or special relativity and that's part of his milestones and they it all began in 1905 he was only 26 years old and he had his miracle year where he he wrote and published five papers which one included special relativity and another one was e equals mc squared uh, explained uh and uh, just a marvelous year for him and at this time uh just very much like king uh, the uh, Mercury was ahead of the sun and it got so far it stopped uh, in progression. It seemed to hover in this one degree and it hovered trine Uranus. And that's when he came up with all these incredible ideas, these cre and incredible scientific theories. Uh, he just, um, they just came pouring out. Uh, and, uh, and yet uh, he had trouble with uh their acceptance initially, and you can see that in his progressed 
uh, moon down here at the bottom is sesquis quadrant maki maki. Uh, people, some people were saying, I didn't even know he knew about relativity. Um, so he was seemed to be. Uh, people were uncertain about him. They they thought this was unusual. Um, but uh, as his Mercury now doubles back, it's not going to sextile that lovely uh, Jupiter here. He's not going to have that going for him yet. He's got a lot to work to do. But it, I just point that out because that comes into uh, later. Um, so he has to work for 10 years to generalize relativity. He couldn't just uh, be a happy with uh, special special conditions. He, he, he was really un under fire for that. And so 10 years later, he was able to complete that work and complete the, um, the uh, mathematical formulas that were absolutely essential to back up his theories. And so what do we find here is just... Just exactly like Leonardo, af after uh, Mercury uh, is out of the way of that beautiful tr uh, uh, Grand Trine area, the moon comes in to go be where Mercury was as he comes out with his general relativity. Um, it's now trying Uranus. Uh, and the moon has now conjuncted Maki Maki. It's almost like... Um, People are saying something completely different now. Wow, he had some wild ideas, but he's given us the math. He really is a visionary. He's a genius. Um, so the problem, though, he still had things to do because Einstein had, had done the math, but he needed to physically prove his theories in the real world. And that was going to be hard because he needed someone to observe a special solar, uh, full solar eclipse. Uh, he needs to show that any object that's on the side of the disk during eclipse, like a star, that that starlight has moved to show that space has curved. And in 1915, World War I had just begun. It was uh, not going to be easy to get to get this experiment done. And it really did take till 1919 because you had to find, uh, you know, peace had to come uh, come to the, uh, the Europe and uh, they needed to find the right eclipse that was going to happen that would have a star in the right position. And it happened. And they sent out two teams and they got uh, they got the photographs. The, the cloud cover didn't didn't ruin everything. And now you see his progressed sun is now set up to sextile Ju uh, Jupiter as it continues to be in range of sextile Uranus. He's he's done it. Um, and even another wonderful thing is progressed moon has uh, gotten to Pluto and Haumea, powerful changer of the world. And he, it's almost like he has um, he has eclipsed Pluto and Haumea in his achievement. So now what are we going to expect with the this completion? I, I think some of you have to know what's next. He's going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> um and he and wins it at uh, a sextile uh, Jupiter, and even uh, the moon it gets into position to make this a minor grand trine. Uh, he's uh, t wins the it's actually the 1921 Nobel Prize they didn't award. They said, "Well, we'll we're going to award it here in this year, 1922." Um, but if perhaps because I think I've been doing this to you to say, "Oh boy." Wouldn't that have been so nice if it was a six cancer moon? That would have been just perfect. Um, well, it was when he got the news. This is when the Nobel was awarded. It's always December of any year. But you get the phone call in October. And that would have been two degrees earlier at six cancer. That was his perfect moment. The, the first thrill. <laughs> So now let's look at some of these dwarf planets that I've been telling you all about. Um, these are to show you kind of their size. Uh, you can see how Pluto over here on the left and Eris on the right are about the same size. Pluto is just a smidge more uh, uh, l larger. Um, and uh, that's Sharon is, his, is Pluto's moon and Eris has a moon. Uh, the next level down are Haumea and Makimaki at two-thirds uh, the size of Pluto. 
and uh, just h- over half of the size of Pluto is Quawar and Gong Gong. And then the rest of these are just slightly uh, less than half the size, uh, half the size of a Pluto, uh, but still uh, over twice the size of a Vesta and a Pallas, which are the largest asteroids. But even more interesting is their arrangement in the Kuiper Belt, at least the ones that remain in the Kuiper Belt. So Eris, Gong Gong, and Sedna, you're not going to see them in these uh, these configurations. But the dwarf planets actually collect in rings in the Kuiper Belt. And they usually focus around a a, a larger member. And I'm saying that Pluto is the the kingpin in this... uh, uh, area this early ring right outside of neptune where I- ixion and orcus are also at the, about the same uh, orbital year you see that uh, pluto is 248 years orcus 245 ixion 251 they, they're still moving around a lot they're still very eccentric but the the, the orbital number of their uh you know, path around the sun is very close and so why would that be? Uh, I'm sure you're wondering. This is true in all of these uh, these four rings. And it's because these areas evolved to be safe zones, places not crossed by or influenced by other bodies in the solar system that could hit them or could could push them out of their out of orbit, which they could careen into the sun or they could careen out of the solar system. Just to be clear, you are seeing all the largest Kuiper Belt planets um, and they all move in orbits defined by these rings. Um, but the really cool thing I discovered was each ring's planets share an overarching theme centered on its largest member. For example, Pluto, uh, control and manipulation, the power of the individual, the self. You've already seen how Orcus and Anxion operate, either welcoming or- rules or order or trying to surmount such boundaries. You could say that they don't have the charisma or the money or whatever that's the greater power wielded by a Pluto person. Um, so they use rules and restrictions to gain power, each in their own way. And I'm just bringing up the the uh, the <clears throat> the keywords of these others. Maybe some of you might want to take a, a screen capture or something. And let's just move to the middle ring, Haumea. Uh, these Haumea individuals you've heard how there can be a big change, vast change. And, and such people have the power to create, heal, fix things, and will evil, even destroy and purge. Um, but their cohorts, Varina, which uh, we didn't get to, uh, I didn't use examples today. Varina and, and Quawar, you could say they're not so brave as Haumea, who could just, you know, d- do such incredible things. Uh, but Varina does an easy way out. Varanet will lie or fabricate or tell tales to change an uneasy situation, while Quawar uh, w- won't won't go that direction, uh, but wants to gamble. Uh, she can maybe outwit you at sports or some other entertaining activity to get an upper hand to change the the game or the focus. And then the Maki Maki ring, uh, as you've seen. Maki Maki's effect on personal planets is can be shocking, raise concerns. A person is a, a, a genius or a, a mad person. You're not sure which. They're so unpredictable uh, with a vision of which might uh, be a, impossible at first. Ideas so ahead of their time. Now, you saw Varda at, at work with uh, perceiving the unseen having a vision what what no one else can imagine and edison which was my nickname for an unnamed uh, object for i uh, used for my book it did we didn't cover edison but edison uh, people with edison prominent they're good at trying new things new ideas new lines of work and uh now to go back to uh, this other green uh ring the evaluate ring and i just i just bring want to go back to it because this is kind of caught between the the powerful over here and the people who, who can change uh, change things it, it, to a incredible degree so this is an uncomfortable area it must be because i started to get uh as as i did my research that these uh objects had strategies for being in such an uncomfortable spot like uh, unnamed planet uh, uh, 2005 RN43 uh, is uh, people who are quick to stop 
and draw back when under pressure. Uh, while you saw MS4, uh, they decide to dig in, uh, hit the books and pursue a research to make a plan and, and, and get everything, all the knowledge they can in order to be a success. Uh, Salacia, which is also in the ring, I had to pass over here as well, is this implementer for the group, carefully acts and speaks up. And I'm just sorry I didn't have the time to illustrate all these fantastic new plants in action. Uh, I'll just, uh, we're not finished yet, but if you go to moreplutos.com, Plutos with an S on it, and click Meet the Dwarfs, you can get more information about these uh, wonderful uh, new solar system buddies that we have. Um, now, just to get out of the Kuiper Belt, uh, Eris and Gong Gong are, uh, maybe they slightly dip in the area of the uh, Kuiper Belt, as you can see these these orbits, but they have a very erratic orbit. And uh, most of the time, they're much farther away and move very slowly. Um, and I've also talked to you about Gong Gong as the planet of sensitivity and compassion, uh, Eris as our ability to connect or not with other people. Eris is the biggest discovery here. Uh, and not just it rivals, not just because it rivals Pluto in size, it rivals Pluto. It's, it's like the answer to Pluto, which at its worst represented the selfish controlling behavior that sadly flourished in the 20th century. We didn't see a person with Eris natally that reached important milestones with Eris in progression. But let me show you Eris as a country. Um, and we can go through this so quickly because the USA was born uh, at the Declaration of Independence as at sun opposite Eris. Um, and we what, what we had is a government purportedly of the people that ignored half the population as of that in that women, African slaves, non-landowner whites and Native Americans had no say in governing. Uh, they are the others or heiress opposing the U.S. sun. But as that progressed sun starts to move in progression, it gets to here as the Civil War begins. And that's the Civil War to fought to end some of this, uh, this, this uh, terrible situation namely slavery at this point. Uh, and though the, though the effect that of that was only to just make it illegal and not really improve black lives, American lives very much. But then Progress Sun got to the conjunction of with Eris in the uh, right at the moment, uh, a, a ver very, uh, very much exact at Brown, Brown versus Board of Education. That's that civil rights uh, 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 a milestone of uh, segregation being declared unconstitutional. And that was a more effective time to attempt to right wrongs, not just racially, but the period saw efforts to grant women's and gay rights as uh, efforts moved into the 60s. And this is a new moon, you know, this is that new moon kind of thing, a new beginning. Um, and this continues to go on because we've just passed the sextile only uh, Nine years ago, uh, when the S Supreme Court upheld gay marriage uh, at the se sun sextile uh, heiress in progression. So U.S. history clearly shows heiress is about human beings insisting on their hum humanity. And it's a worthy focus for the 21st century. Uh, and now I can get back to the last really uh, surprising um dwarf planet with its 11,400 year orbit, uh, that's Sedna, uh, about uh, being determined, tenacious, and accepting and committed. These are mostly positives. It can also be uh, very s stubborn and, and suffering and, and, uh, and, and uh, long suffering diffic and difficulties. Um, I'd say that, uh, you, as you can imagine, uh, that when the send is out here, it's not moving hardly at all in the sky. Of course, we didn't even know about it at those times. But if you go looking back, like I have in history, and you look at people who had said it in their charts uh, hundreds of years ago, um, if they had good angles with Sedna, they had the good uh, persistence and determination. But challenging Sedna, 
uh, could be a lifetime of hardship, which is the way people lived back then. Now Sedna moves faster and people surmount a Sedna period of trial, whether it's illness or whatever the ordeal is. So it's a blessing to know about Sedna as well as these other unique per personality markers and representations of particular life experiences. Because if you know what you're dealing with, you can prepare and endure. <clears throat> so we're not we're not considering we started late, <laughs> but we're we just have a few bit more points to make that I that have to do a lot with synchronicity. So I hope you will stick with me uh, as we uh, we're five minutes toward the end of the uh, arranged time. But I just want to ask uh, some questions that come to my mind and probably come to yours. How are the people who aren't using it or even interested in astrology somehow in sync with it? If we all live our transits and progressions right on time, do we have built-in guidance? <laughs> we have built-in healing powers, so maybe that's 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 something to that. I've thought that we must be doing something very simple that that keeps us on track. Perhaps we just feel right doing what keeps us on track with the solar system or which leads us to our synchronicity experiences. Another unusual thing. How did we ar arrive at that moment? And note, feel right is not the same as feel good. You could compare us with our solar system sync partner and say, well, the, maybe the key is movement because uh, stars and planets move, earth life moves, humans in society move. Our existence depends on what's around us and how we relate. Uh, we influence each other continually. And I, I do think that there's something probably to that. And I don't know how we'll find out more, but we make a lot of decisions on the fly. And I don't think we pay attention to how many decisions uh, we make. Um, we're always saying oh, yes to that, no to this, yes to that person. Uh, we act to, you know, things that are happening inside ourselves or people are influencing us. Think of the gut feeling we get. I mean, that's that those are bacteria in there and they are other uh, beings. <laughs> are they are they giving us clues that help? Um, I think that uh, it's it's what we want. We but we are uh, a human version of a planet moving in space, influenced by its star and fellow planets. It's. It's just our path isn't smooth. It's not smooth like an orbiting planet. We're jiggling around. But you could also uh, argue that we originated from the same point. Uh, so we could share deep down in, in our atoms, maybe the same timing or tempo. Um, but synchronicities are so different. They can appear from anywhere. Uh, they can't be predicted. And when they appear, how do we know if their message is important to be followed? So now we're at the last uh, segment of our of our presentation, which is how important was that synchronicity? And it means I have to tell one last synchronicity story of my own, which is about astrology's progression technique, a big mystery. Uh, just to give you the facts, uh, around sometime around 1600, we believe that uh, the famed astronomer Johannes Kepler uh, must have developed it. Um, and I can't get into those details, but but in all those time, no astrologer has been able to explain how it works. Everyone thinks it's very indispensable, but why? And once I realized how important these dwarf planets are, I was I was sad to think I had to write a book. I was perfectly happy not. But I wanted to use progressed milestones, and it bothered me there was no theory about its mechanism. I kept saying it's a natural fraction of transits, one day rotation, one year orbit. But that wasn't enough. That, that wasn't enough to be convincing. And then I was working at my desk at Caltech on another problem, and I experienced a synchronicity. It was, the, it was two problems again, although I didn't realize that it, what the second problem was. Photoshop kept zooming out on me. I was This had been happening for weeks. Uh, suddenly an image would blow up and it, I would see it be 400%. I, I hadn't touched 400. I didn't know what it was. And it then it happened one day and I didn't do anything. I just looked and I realized that my hand was above the trackpad. It wasn't touching, but my fingers were trembling slightly. And I realized that that was enough to zoom it out. And I was just 
uh, thrilled beyond belief. And I, in fact, I started to say, I'm too happy. What? Why is this such a big deal? And then I thought, am I having a synchronicity? What is something, what is, is there something more important to me that is like this? Something very large that's the same as something much smaller, yet it's the same thing. And then I had it. I've thought of how I had been working so hard on progression. Why? Why? And it's that progression is the same as transits. It acts the same. It's, and then I realized it's a fractal. It's, it's, it's a part of transits and it's the, it's self similar. It, it's not a supplement like it's been used for hundreds of years to to fill out your timeline when you're an astrologer. It's a complete pattern of transits if you use the dwarf planets because you have enough bodies to, to, to get the whole story. And if you don't know what fractals are, they're repeating patterns. And you, you saw a whole bunch of them at the very beginning. The powerful center orbiting members that's a fractal because each example, you see a part of a larger parent. A planetary system is a part of a solar system. And it kind of looks like a solar system if you have enough moons anyway. And if a solar system is a part of a galaxy and it has the basic structure of a galaxy, the powerful center or orbiting members, and that it goes up and up from there, even in the galaxy groups. And atoms are the same. They're a component of the entire universe. Cells are a component of all life. Life forms societies and ecosystems. We, we're all components as well as things in ourselves. And the easiest way I can really get bring this home to you, think of a broccoli. That is the perfect fractal pattern. Because if you take a broccoli before you eat it and you before you even cook it, Break off a branch of it and look at it. You'll say, that looks like a broccoli. It looks like the entire broccoli. It doesn't look identical to the broccoli, to the the parent. It's self-similar. It's good enough. And transit pattern and its branch pro progression are similar patterns. So time itself must be patterned. Self, I mean, astrologers kind of know this, but th this is an argument you could make. Self-similarity is all around us on all levels in this way. And if the universe keeps churning out the same pattern as we saw, and maybe that is a fundamental thing, it could even be a recommendation. We should group. We should congregate, interact, get along. And now I just want to show one astrologer's synchronicities as far as do they have a milestone at those big synchronicities that I related to you. And they do. I have the natal pattern return, as I showed you, happening at those milestones for all those famous people. And here, I mean, I, I humbly show you enough information to, to for you to see this. But this is my, my chart on the left. And I have Mercury, uh, Venus, Trine, Neptune, and Sextile, Sedna. And when I am trying to talk to my dad about getting married, I have Mercury and, and Venus are again conjunct because at my birth, Mercury had just stop, stopped and gone forward. So Venus is going along all by itself and Mercury had to catch up. And they are now 90 degrees away from Sedna and Neptune. And my father was not happy with my idea. It was very stressful, but I didn't care because unbeknownst to me, my progressed moon was trying Maki Maki. I was excited. I couldn't get wait to get home to my mentor and say, you don't need any of this stuff, and, which he didn't take seriously, of course. But I was cr incredibly, and, th and this changed the course of my life. I had to figure out what they were as I also had to figure out astrology. And then there was the voice from the television. And when did that happen? The my progressed moon is opposite progressed Mercury. I had that natally. I should have it here in a, a, a little. Uh, that is a natal pattern return uh, as I had moon opposite Mercury, although it was five degrees from being exact here. It's like almost a half a degree exact. And it was very stressful. I, I have to leave New Orleans and take everything I own, incl including a million books and get to California. Is that really a good idea? 
but it was an opportunity and I, I started to realize it other than uh, a, a, an opportunity for a, a romance. It was a bigger opportunity than that, but it was a gamble. Here's Quawar and that sextile there. Uh, and, and so that was also working out. And then progression is a fractal. What was that saying? And that's when my progress moon was here. And it's in the grand trine with Sedna and Pluto uh, and Haumea. And it's in a, a minor grand with Pluto, Haumea and, 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 and Neptune. It was just this most incredible thing. And I, I knew right away this was something that was overwhelming. And even more so, uh, I didn't even realize I wasn't even paying attention that I had a very, uh, uh, very, very um, loose conjunction with Orcus about order and, and, and patterning. But here at that moment, I'm having an exact progressed sextile between my progressed Orcus and my progressed sun. It, it was, again, a natal pattern return, a synchronicity, because I was having a synchronicity. So what might it all mean? I think if st astrology can validate a synchronicity as life-changing or show someone was right on time for their milestones, life is no longer random chance. It's a path somewhere. Each life interacts with others for greater purpose, and that can be demonstrated. You work it out, work it out with these charts for anyone's life. If time's pattern can be read as shown, this kind of opens up a whole new view of life, too, because time becomes like DNA, stuffed with meaning, able to be read. And like crime scene DNA, which I think discouraged a lot of crimes, uh, you know, we, we can't really know, uh, crimes, murders, uh, rapes, uh, but who could be sure they'd be undetected? So the advent of a time DNA could have a similar significant, significant impact on our lives, when my people will start asking, when will my depression end? Did something indicate I'd lose my child? Should I steer clear of my violent ex-spouse? Should I follow my dreams? And that's all the time we have. I, I hope I have you have been illuminated. There's something just like meaningful coincidences, and it's astrology available 24 by 7. Uh, to those who learn its symbolic languages, it's just it's out there to be looked at, and that's that's the meaning of the of the title. and And thank you, uh, my contact information, and uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, we're we're a little uh, over the time. I, I was probably right on time for for the time we actually started. Um, but let me. Uh, let me, uh, I, I'm going to leave this up a little bit more so you make sure you can get my um, contact information. Um, oh, thank you. Which, uh, <clears throat> uh, Ariel, you said you can't see the chart. I'm sorry. Is there something I could go back to? Ariel, you're, you're muted. You're muted. So, uh, no, actually, I'm going to wait for the recording. I'm sure it's there. Greg, Greg <laughs> wrote that it, it he that he saw it. So okay. that okay, that, very good. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Or I can my, I can mail it to you. <laughs> oh, amen. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> if anyway. everyone has my contact information, I can go and 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 stop sharing. Would that be okay, or or uh, or should I keep it up in case there's a question about something I had put in a slide? Let's see. Oh, uh, thank you for people who said where they were from. I'm so gratified to see that. Um, I'm just now getting to look at chart. You know, it was quite quite an experience because not only was I giving the presentation, but I had to in let people in from the chat from the waiting room. <laughs> so so there were quite a few times where I had to be um, uh, pressing that button. Mary Kay. Hey. Um, thank you for taking my question. Um, very yeah. interesting talk. I have a big question. I mean, th this is so fascinating about these dwarf planets. Um, and I, I, I don't, I, I don't profess to be an astrologer. I've studied it on and off over the years, but I don't know very much. I know enough to be dangerous. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but I have a question about how you can, how these meanings were derived because we haven't known about the dwarf 
planets for long. And I know astrology itself has evolved over probably th- at least a thousand years True. in terms of the, the the meanings of the planets and and all and the signs and all of that. So how were these dwarf planet meanings so quickly derived? Well, when I started working on them, it was uh, 2007, uh, t- 2008, because Eris, Maki Maki, and, and uh, Halmea uh, were discovered in 2005. And uh, and it took a few years for, for all the names to, to happen. Uh, I, I was actually working with Maki Maki and Haumea, and they didn't have names. I was just using a lot of charts. I was just, I ran every chart I ever of any person I ever knew and uh, any person I ever loved. And I just had it all in solar fire. It was actually cu- quite quick. Uh, and it, just a few days sometimes I would take for me to get the hang of what was going on. And then once I saw people who had prominent Haumea or Maki Maki or something like that, then I would say, well, what happened when they had a milestone with Maki Maki or Haumea, whether it was their sun or Mercury or something or, or, or a transit or progression. And then I started to realize how they were being consistent. And that's what I felt. They had to be consistent. They had to work in country charts. They had to work in transiting progression. They had to work all the time in the same way. And it got to the point, I, I remember when I first started to, to get the idea for Maki Maki, I know it was something really oddball. I mean, really almost insulting, uh, you know, and that was the shock part. And I kept thinking, you know, uh, I, I, I wonder what it was. And one thing I had been thinking for years is I don't see the crazy in Salvador Dali's chart. He doesn't have Uranus in 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 aspect. It, it, it was it, it was to, to no no major aspects of Uranus to personal planets. And so I was at a restaurant and I heard somebody at another table say Salvador Dali, and I went, "He's Maki Maki." And I went home and I looked, and he had Sun, Mercury, and Mars at, with mock at, with Maki Maki. And I'm like, "Okay, all right, now you're talking." Uh, mm-hmm. And that was so I would see people and I would say. This person has Maki Maki, uh, or this person has Haumea. I I, I do that a lot in the, these years. Uh, but you had to, and and I've, I I had a precedent for this because Richard Tarnas says that when uh, Uranus and Neptune's meanings were developed, it wasn't through the myths. It was through lots of chart work. And he, this is something he said uh, in in his Prometheus uh, uh, book about Uranus. So basically, you have developed these meanings. Then is what you're saying. I have. I oh, and okay. I've, I've had people because it's being it's it's being very slow to get people to work with them. And I think a lot of people are developing some meanings. Maybe are more hopeful than uh, based by um, chart work. Uh, and and I and and I I understand the you, you know you you it it's, it takes a lot of time. I actually went from a full time job to a part time job to actually do the work over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, but I was able to do that. And I'm sure not many people are. Yeah. Uh, Ariel, I think, uh, I mean, if that's all, Mary Kay, I, I was yeah. just, okay, thank, thank you, Mary. You. Yeah. Uh, Ariel, gonna... you had a hand up. I did. I was gonna put <laughs> in a plug for the Dwarf Planet University. Uh, <laughs> simply because there is one. I mean, a lot of right. what you've done was was pioneering, just amazing. But but others have also built on that work and have built. Well, it's true. A- a- Alan Clay has thanked me for the work I've done with the dwarf planet. So uh, he he has he knows my work, and he I, I've only just said, uh, Alan, if you if you're using my 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 work, you 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 do usually say tip me a nod because in my book, I I I actually in the Maki Maki and Haumea chapters. I had gone and looked online and also in what there were some things published. Uh, and I gave a nod to all those people who had uh, their own d- definitions. Uh, and then I said why I might disagree. But I, am, I have an English background. So that's that's second nature to me to do the research and and, and then do the notations. But yes, he, he does. And he agrees with my Maki Maki interpretation. And I was very gratified about that. Absolutely. Uh, your book is brilliant. Period. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, you can just speak up or raise a hand or uh, I, I, again, I'm. I have a couple yes, comments. Greg. How Greg, are you doing? Sure. Thank you so much for regaling us today. It's always great to see you. Um, 
you could t- i think now you could take that uh you know your slide down i think by sure. now people have your uh and that way we could see each other perhaps a little okay. bit easier um uh, first thing, actually, I just, just want to add uh, to that conversation. One of the things I really appreciate about the work that you do is that you're not so heavily reliant upon the myth. And I think too often there is a spiritual aspect about it because we define things and that gets into a different discussion. But too often the mythology then governs the interpretation. And what I really appreciate about you, Sue, is you're doing it more through research and observation. And I think that there needs to be, you know, uh, both. But uh, but too often there's just, you know, because the, the the question that Mary Kay had asked is very valid. You know, these are relatively new planets. How do Who we did know it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, all of but, the myth says blah, 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 blah. And I think well, well, the, the one thing kind of interesting uh, I always say is the myth uh, usually has a kernel of it, like Eris, uh, the, yes, you can't exactly. take the whole exactly. myth. You just take yeah. that she wasn't invited to the wedding. She was an excluded person. Uh, but actually, now, Kwawar is, you know, is a, 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 a god, a creation god of the Native Americans who sang and danced the world into existence. And it is for entertainment and fun and playing. And so Kwawar has a perfect myth uh, uh, for, for, for the actual operation of planet Kwawar. And Ixion, with its breaking of rules, uh, uh, is that's the first murderer who broke all these rules uh, with the Olympian gods. I mean, that person got it dead on. The intuition of that person who named that body was perfect. So it doesn't yeah, that, work that, out. I think it goes into that spiritual. The, 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 two other things. Number two, when you put up your chart, you didn't put it in there. But I believe your nodal axis was exactly conjunct. The galactic center. I <laughs> would you? Would you uh, am, am I right about that? Am I? I am took I right? the nodal axis out of every chart after I was working on this for weeks because I didn't want to have to answer questions about that and Chiron. I mean, I just I was already d- juggling all these things, and I thought I want less things to worry about. That no, no, no. I got it. I'm just but saying. Thank that, you, that thank for you, you uh, for noticing. You, yeah, because all this work that's totally galactic in nature, and here you are in your I, north node. Was I, I hadn't even there. thought about that. I haven't even yeah. thought about that. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then finally, just to make clear, I mean, so essentially, I, I know you had mentioned that you were going to give this talk. Essentially, I was thinking, oh wow, how will I be able to see synchron- <laughs> synchronicities mm-hmm. in my chart? Mm-hmm. you can't necessarily know as it's going on like i can't be like oh this is going to happen to this and therefore i'm going to come up with the theory of relativity 3.0 i mean you know we can always go back and retro you know retrospectively and say well you know yeah we, we, yeah right but but greg all you have to do is 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 the the parts where it would be would be in natal pattern uh return natal pattern repetition uh you know i mean just the think about what what you have in uh in, in your in your natal chart and when when those things are going to reform it's a conjunction and now becomes a sextile or it's a becomes a, a square or or something like that 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 might be uh when you would have uh, a life-changing uh milestone i mean i, I you know, understand we say I, synchronicity I, I, yeah. and and not all synchronicities are serious business that I, change your lives you know they can this, be just is- encouragement no, no, I, 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 that's essentially my point, because, the, you know, when okay. astrologers uh, use historical charts to prove something and say, oh, this is when, you know, the queen ascended to the throne, we can say oh, that was when Pluto was on her midheaven, for example, you yeah. know, mm-hmm. um, for I don't know if that's true or not, but right, as an example, right. but if it weren't, we would point to something else and say, oh, that was when Neptune was squaring her this, or that was when Mars was doing that. And w- we could always retrospectively, you know, it's different with what you're saying because you would be looking for the repetition of that pattern from the natal chart. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, it's just one of the points that I, I think that one of the reasons why I struggle sometimes when people are talking about um, proving their case uh, uh, with transits, uh, or even progressions is this that mm-hmm. we can interpret anything any way we want to, you know, somebody asked uh, an astrologer once, you know, how can you see the death of my father? And he's like, it could be anything. And he's like, Oh, it could be Neptune by solar arc. But incidentally, along those lines, Sue, do you use solar arcs? Is that something you didn't do them today? You focus more. You know, I don't, I, I, I never actually looked at that. I, from an early time, I had been looking only transits and progression, but I felt validated when I first, uh, you know, spent the money and had Rob Han uh, give me a, a chart reading. 
he only uses transits and 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 progression. <laughs> so I thought that must be the gold standard. <laughs> Um, okay. Although okay. I think he might look at solar arc, but it's not a main feature of his. It's it's really a side. Uh, it, it might he might go there when, but I mean he's not using. Uh, he he really needs to be using at least some of the bigger dwarf planets. And I hate to say that, but uh, I, I I believe me, I've kind of tried to encourage him, uh, but. All right. well, a, one other one other final question. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bija calculation for progressions and whether or not you ever use it. There, there's a whole school. I've of heard thought. that, but I'm not sure. You probably I probably heard it from you in something in some other class. I, I don't know. Okay, all right. No, I was just curious about. <laughs> I, I work with both the standard and the Bija, and I was okay. wondering if there's something that you happen to see. Thank no, you so it, much for uh, for enjoying uh, you know offering this presentation today, Sue. Always thanks, thanks for, for hanging in there, and uh, you know, especially during the technical uh, difficulty at the beginning um because uh, uh, it was all just because uh Juliet wasn't at home uh she she had limited capabilities on her phone to try to be host and make me a host it, it, that, that was the whole difficulty so thanks Greg appreciate it always a pleasure um it's, and it's so, so nice to see you Marsha uh you know I uh I don't know how many uh uh people from the last coincidence cafe were here who saw Marsha speak uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but uh, I was there with, and, and I had to contact Marsha saying, you know, my uh, little uh, MS4 ring, it sounds like your POP uh, 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 strategy. I, I, I even, I even got your book today. So I feel like here's a coincidence. Oh. I, I had ordered it and it came today and I was able to sit there and read the beginning of your book in order to keep from freaking out as I was waiting for this whole, this, this talk to happen. Cause I, you know, I, I get nervous talking, but, uh, I, I, uh, there's so much going on in my head to, to find a little stream to say something cogent, but I wanted to, Note that it's easy to pick up on your brilliance, your passion. Thank you. Um, the the uh, it would be fascinating for me to see the chart on which of the archetypes, which of the planets, um, are influencing you for your research and your persistence and the the great joy, obviously, you have in the language of it in expanding the possibilities of what astrology can do. I haven't had a reading in quite a few years. I've had many in my past and studied it a bit, but I was part of the, during part of your presentation, I was thinking the old question about what is fate and what is destiny. And I had once uh, somebody suggested that, your birth chart is kind of like the fate. There's some things that are set. Mm -hmm. We could say that of anything. We say that you incarnate. You have a body. You have something that appears to be uh, a given, has givens. And there will be modifications and changes and shifts, but some part of it is what is a given. And then destiny or what is moving, how do we move through? And I've always enjoyed that whether it's astrology or some other paradigm or science or language, when I have a question or some burning thought or an aha, there are so many ways to have it answered or corroborated. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a very good friend in LA that I mentioned who has an astrology academy. And he knew that I was psychic and I would read him and he would read my chart, but he would show me something like a transit and I would pick up psychically something about a particular planet from what little or what I knew about the archetype or something. And I'd have a sense. And then he would give me a reading, which would expand it and, and elaborate on it, but also corroborate the instinct and intuition, which I think is related since everything to me is all connected all the time and is therefore always synchronous, hmm. but our conscious instrument doesn't allow us to, we would be probably unable to function on planet Earth if we were aware that everything is always sync as within and out all the time. 
It'd be like too much information on steroids. There would be right? no way to, yeah, there'd be one, no way to process it. But as a mindfulness practitioner and meditator and psychic and so forth, it, it's evident to me that anytime I, I still myself and I pay attention, whatever mm. is happening with me is always available for me to perceive it in some form out there. And if I'm tuning into the planets or to a planet, I can feel its influence. You're someone mm. on the planet who is interpreting and articulating and giving form to what it is that others have said it, it's about, or you're finding your own meanings. Whereas I'm sort of lazy right brain, my particular love is to glean, to know, and then I'll find some kind of corroboration from someone who's studying it as a science or, a, or developing as a language mm -hmm. of another kind of language. Uh, but so that's my two cents worth. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much for that. Thank I know you. Intense Thank you. preparation for this. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and uh, you know, I've been thinking about a lot of these things uh, over a long time. So uh, it was great to be able to present all of this to to people who want to uh, hear about it. And it's just so gl great to see you. Um, Mary and, and Alan, I'm so happy to see you. These are personal friends of mine who are who are attending today and uh um and i guess rob is in there somewhere in the mary box <laughs> um but did uh did did you have a a, a a think of a question uh either one of you alan or mary or rob that uh, you wanted to ask i just thought i'd ask you well, we might have uh we lost somebody um or uh, allison renee or anita amelia Okay, Anita. Hi. Um, so I have a question that is a little bit more, I guess I'll say it's more basic in a, a sense. Okay. Um, I'm into astrology and I, I know a lot about it, but not to, I guess, the level that um, <laughs> that you that you know, know it, of course. So um, I've been really into synchronicity just from the standpoint of having experienced these moments that have just been so mind blowing. Like I'll have a thought of something and then I'll tie it together and, and then boom, right in front of my eyes, something mm -hmm. that exactly matches the thing that I was just thinking or the it answers mm -hmm. the question that I've been, that's been heavy on my heart. And something that has been going on recently with me is I, I've met a person who I have so many insane synchronicities with and mm. I found their birthday uh, found out their birth time like maybe two years after meeting them and I did a a, a synastry chart with them and then it had the star of David or the six-pointed mm. star okay. which you brought up in the um right. thing and I've I've been googling like what does the six-pointed star mean I learned today is <laughs> actually called a grand sextile um right. but I wasn't able to find any information but the problem that I'm having or the, the, the big question that keeps coming up for me is when you get a lot of confirming synchronicities um, and then you see stuff in astrology that kind of point to what you thought this connection was about, but your actual real life experience is not matching up with that. What, mm. what does that mean? It makes me wonder, is the synchronicity just a manifestation of my feelings about the thing so I'm thus attracting uh things that affirm how I feel versus some higher greater thing trying to point me in a the direction are, are you saying that you uh don't have the the sync with the this other person but it looks like uh, when you look at all the when you see the synchronicities and you see the chart it looks like you should be uh more more in tune with one another is that yeah. is that yeah like okay when we Met, how how long like, have you how how long have you had experience with this person? I've known them now. It's about to be seven years. Okay, so, all right. Well, that's that's the a decently long time. That uh, yeah, you know, and it, it, there might be. Yeah, I hate to say it, but there might be some dwarf planets in there that aren't so friendly. Uh, yeah. So there might be, and so there might be a lot of uh, willingness on your end, and, and maybe even on the other end. But yet, there's something that we don't know that's that's interfering. Um, and and I know when I I see people who say, oh, you know, I don't know how this works. I I have to, you know, uh, ha have uh, uh, put put this uh, 
uh, you know, some stars or some uh, some other a- aspects in there. And I said, well, maybe you need to look at a dwarf planet, uh, at least the top four, Eris, Makimaki, Haumea, and Sedna, um, and see what that does for you. But again, and, and you can do that online, you know, astro.com. Uh, you yeah. can actually get a free account there and you can put in these these objects into the wheel and it's a free thing. Um uh, and they have a lot, a lot of. They just you can't do a lot like secondary progression or anything. But thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah, because yeah, sure, I've always about that. What is it trying to tell me? If it doesn't, if it's not matching up with reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, it because nobody ever thought. Oh, I need more planets. Nobody. Kepler didn't think that. Uh, any anybody. The only one who thought uh, we need more planets was Alfred Witt. Uh, who was at the uh, early 20th century, and he's the one who came up with the Uranian planets. He just decided, well, hell with it, I'm, I'm, I'll find them myself. And the new planets have never matched up to the Uranians, uh, which y- you might know about. So, <laughs> so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. So here we are. And any anything else? And I haven't. Uh, I had to say. Um, I haven't <laughs> haven't been able to. Um, oh, I see. Rob is here and is questionless. <laughs> Thank you, uh, great for the great job remark. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm going to save these chats so I can read it later because it's just um, hard hard for me to uh, to take everything in. It's just been wonderful to talk to you. Um, I, I feel reborn because, of course, the talk is over. You know, because I wanted it so much. To be uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, a good uh, a, a good thing, and uh, and uh, Marcia will be talking, so uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So, but uh, I, I maybe I should uh, let let you go, and uh, I'll have to report into Juliet that everything uh, we had no snafus after the initial problems. <laughs> um, okay, I just was reading what. Uh, Marsh is staying here on chat, so she's gone. I'll let me save it again. It should automatically save everything uh, that that at, by the end of the thing. But uh, <clears throat> it, it, I'll tell you, it, it, it was what was really panicky is when I I signed on and then I found out we were having these terrible technical difficulties, and uh, I, I I had been calm and kept myself cool, and then suddenly I started like panic city. Um, but uh, I appreciate everybody having joined us today, and uh, I'll, uh, I hope to see you at Future Ca- Ca- Coincidence Cafe, or if you have any other question that you uh, think about later, um, ca- email me at sue at morplutos.com or visit my website at morepolutos.com uh, because I, I really felt terrible. I couldn't give you like twice as many examples of these uh, incredible uh, operations of the dwarf planets. They're, they're just, I mean, they, they, they gave me the, uh, <clears throat> I, I've really had to uh, cut back on, on, on my, my salaried work for all these years because they're so important. They had to, they had to be a, a I had to get them out while I could still do do the work, uh, but it's been totally worth it. And it's it's and for me to come and talk to a group like this, um, I'm just it's a great relief to me. Um, so thank you, and especially my friends Alan and Mary and Rob, uh, but also Ariel and Greg, who I also know, and uh, Anita and Amelia. I hope to meet you at some point or another too. So thanks everybody. Um, appreciate your help. God bless you. God bless you all.